So I'm pleased now to turn the mic over to uh, Dr. Steve Henke uh, from Johns Hopkins. Steve, uh, like I said, is a co-chair of this, and we really appreciate his uh, partnership. Um, and again, I'm thrilled that he also has a connection to Dr. Mundell and has known him for a long time. And uh, just so happened that you'll see Steve. Both of us brought this book. We thought we were the only ones with it uh, from 1983, but uh, apparently there's more than just us. So, Steve, thanks for being with us. Yeah. Thank it. you, Jimmy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be here, uh, particularly with the, the Kemp Mundell tie in from 34 years ago, and if you go through the volume, it, it's incredible who was actually in attendance 34 years ago. Of course, there was Camp and, and Mundell, and then you had George Schultz, Art Laffer, Robert Triffin, uh, William Hutt, uh, Robert Weintraub, Robert Triffin, Otmar Eminger, Beryl Sprinkle, Charles Kendallberger, Henry Kissinger, John Davenport, Gottfried Hobbler, Jörg Nihans, Louis Lehrman, Ron McKinnon, Don Regan, Jacob Frankel, Paul Craig Roberts, Alan Reynolds. I mean, you, you had a, really an all-star cast of just amazing that, that there was ever a conference with that collection of people. Uh, I will follow on really with what, what Bob said in these clips. Uh, the, the title of, of my brief remarks is Exchange Rate Stability, Please. And the first point I'd like to make is that generalized financial volatility is the Achilles heel of capitalism. And it is so because the general public doesn't like volatility. The second point is that business community doesn't like volatility. And, and uh, of course, politicians who always follow public opinion don't like volatility. And as a result of volatility, particularly when it's severe, you have tremendous policy changes that occur. And most of these policy changes, if you trace them very carefully and diagnose them, have always been detrimental to trade, commerce, and, and capitalism. So that's the, the nub of the problem with volatility. It hinges, volatility that is, on exchange rate volatility. And, and to illustrate the nexus between foreign exchange rate volatility and uh, uh, general volatility of financial metrics, whether you're looking at interest rates, stock mar market prices, commodity prices, and so forth, all you have to do is look at volatility under the gold standard, and if you go from 1870 to 1913, take that period and check the volatility, look un under the so-called dollar standard, which is more, more or less roughly 1950 to 1970, and then post-73, you've got floating. If you have those three periods and you take any kind of financial metric and check the volatility, it, it, it goes up very rapidly as you go uh, towards flexibility and move away from fixity. Now, the first thing I'd like to go through is to illustrate uh, the, the last episode of huge volatility. Uh, let me see if I can run this. We've got our supply side dashboard, which Bob Mandel first introduced to me. Do I run this or do you run this? <laughs> okay. Uh, Bob, uh, early on, Bob and I served on the Financial Advisory Council of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and uh, one of our first meetings in 2009. Bob brought up what, what in, in effect, was a supply-side dashboard. And, what, what you, and he was talking about it, by the way, in, in one of these clips. And, and that is, if, if you look at the uh, U.S. dollar in July of 2008, it, it was at 
one, one, the dollar euro rate was 1.58. The dollar was very weak. And, and then, of course, we had the, the, the events of, of the summer and fall of 2008 and the Lehman bankruptcy. And, and of course, the, the dollar soared, as Mundell pointed out, and, and uh, the, the euro, we had, we had about a 20 percent change in the, in the USD. Steve, we need you to use the mic. Need, need, okay. Can, can we pull it out, Sean? That, that's okay. Yeah, okay, good. Thanks. So, so at any rate, the, uh, we, we had about a 20 percent uh, change in the, in the value of the uh, exchange rate. The, 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 the euro collapsed, the, the dollar went up, and of course, along with that, you had about a 20 percent change in the price of gold. Gold collapsed in, in that short period of time, and when you look at crude oil, we, we went from 133 to 57. Uh, we had about a 57 percent drop in the price of oil. So we had a lot of volatility. <laughs> we're, we're on to volatility. <laughs> volatility is bad. No one, no one likes volatility. And in addition to this, of course, the volatility in the exchange rate and, and the commodity prices factored through to the inflation rate. And Mundell was also talking about this in the clip. Look, look at look at what happened to the. Could we have the next slide? Actually, I've got the slides here. I don't have to go over there and be pointing around. I, I'll read them off. Of, I'll <laughs> read and point to the 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 peak of of the um, inflation rate that that Mundell referred to was in July of 2008, and, and that peak was 5.5 percent up, up here. So the inflation, that, that, that was a very high rate, by the way. It, the last time it reached that level was in October of 1990. So, so it was a, a very high rate uh, before the, the, the dollar started soaring and, and eventually Lehman collapsed and so forth. It then reached uh, zero, the inflation rate, very rapidly uh, in, in December of 2008. Uh, and the last time that had been uh, uh, reached, zero, was in 1955. And, and then we actually went down to a, a deflation uh, with prices uh, on a year-over-year -year basis in the negative range in July of 2009, and the last time we'd seen deflation was in 1949. So this is a huge amount of volatility in, in the system, it's taking off from what? The most important price in the world, the dollar-euro rate. Uh, I mean, as Mundell said in his clip, we have these two blocks now that are absolutely critical. And so there's a lot of volatility in the system, and what happens? Uh, I, I should point out, by the way, if, if you look at the supply side dashboard, we had the, the dollar euro rate, we, we have the price of gold and, and the price of oil, and, and, and we also had inflation on, the, on this chart that's up there right now. If you looked at Bernanke's dashboard, he was looking at six things, and, and exchange rates weren't even on his uh, dashboard. He wasn't even looking at exchange rates. So this is why the label supply side dashboard <laughs> is on top of that first graph. That, this is the way supply side economists look at things. They, they look at prices and focus on price changes rather than changes in quantities. Uh, now, what happened? Uh, as a result of all of volatility, as I said, the public doesn't like it, businesses don't like it, politicians don't like it, and you always end up with huge policy changes as a result of excessive volatility and exchange rates and uh, other, uh, not, uh, other financial indicators that, that spin off of changes in exchange rates. And as night follows day, of course, uh, all the volatility that we had in 2008 and 2009, we got what? We, we got massive policy changes. 
and I can remember it, is the dollar was soaring, and, and right after Lehman went under, uh, at that time, uh, John Major was uh, chairman of the board of the Kuwait National Bank, and I was a board member, and, and Major called me uh, right away when Lehman went down to discuss, well, <laughs> what, when's the next shoe going to fall? What's, what's going to happen? And neither one of us came to much of a conclusion about anything specific, but Major made a, a, a point that stuck with me, and he said, he said as a result of the volatility that we've seen and, and this pretty spectacular bankruptcy of Lehman, we, we, are, we both concluded that there will be huge changes. We don't know what changes in the policy realm, but there will be big changes. And I remember that really did stick with me after quite a long conversation with Sir John. So we did get massive changes. We got regime uncertainty. We've had a very slow recovery as a result. And in short, we had an attack on free markets and interventionism on steroids since all the volatility in the dollar euro rate and, and the Lehman collapse. So what to do? Uh, I think what to do should start with stabilizing the most important price in the world, and that's the, the dollar-euro exchange rate, uh, and stabilize it in, in, a, in a zone of, let us say, 120 to 140. Now, what would the rules be? How, how would that uh, affect things? Um, we, we would have... If, if, the, if the dollar was strong at 120, we, we would have the dollar uh, not being defended by anyone, but, but the euro would be the weak one, and that would be defended by the U.S. The, the U.S. would be doing exactly what Mundell said. The, the U.S. would be buying euros and selling dollars at 120, and at 140, when the dollar uh, was weak and the euro was strong, the ECB would be buying dollars and selling euros. Uh, in addition to that, I think there are probably a, a, a hundred central banks that should really should be put out of business in, in, in the world, and, and that could be done very easily by either cloning one of the major currencies, the dollar or the euro, for example, with a currency board system, or simply adopting the, the dollar or the euro. Now, I... In, in going through my slides, I, I actually forgot a slide, so let me go back to the slide that contains the original research I did for this talk. Um, maybe I was listening to Mundell and cloning Mundell so carefully that I forgot <laughs> my, my own little contribution. I had three assistants working since January, actually, reading every uh, annual report of the top 100 companies in the United States by market cap. And, and the, the, their task was to, to read through the, the annual reports and see if the company said anything about exchange rates, whether they, anything. And, and in particular, I wanted them to focus on uh, negativity and negative comments uh, that they came up with and included in their annual report. We're, in short, was exchange rate volatility a problem? I, I indicated that the public doesn't like volatility, and I said businesses don't like volatility. Well, I wanted to prove that they don't like volatility. And, and out of the 100 companies, the largest cap companies in the United States, there, there wasn't one annual report that, that didn't have a complaint about exchange rate volatility. And so if we go to the, the next uh, slide, here, here's the summary, and, and without getting out in the, the weeds on this, where's my little, yeah, here I am. Uh, there, there are five groups, and, and, and this is just a percentage of the companies in each group, and, and this goes, group one is a group that is complaining about exchange rate volatility and has a very elaborate bench calculations of, of how, how much their profits were affected by 
the exchange rate volatility that occurred during the year. And, and so the gradient just goes down to the end at five. They're just complaining about it, but there, there's no detailed calculation a, a, about uh, how, how much their net profits would have been different if there had been no volatility. It's, it's simply a mention. So we're going from very, very excruciating detail and analysis of the exchange rate volatility and how it's hurting you to, to a little less, but they'll have, in, in this group two, which is the major one, they'll have calculations and they'll have the hedges that they have on to, buy, they're buying insurance basically with a hedge. So exchange rate volatility is costly. You, you, you have to buy insurance. If you didn't have exchange rate volatility, it would be the same as uh, telling you that uh, there, it's impossible to have a fire in your warehouse, so you, you don't buy fire insurance. So it, it has a definite cost, not only in the, in the hedges that you're putting on, those are, those are not free, the, those are insurance premiums you're having to pay. And in addition to that, you, you can't hedge all the risk out, and so there are actual losses uh, that occur on a pro forma basis with the companies. And to give you an idea of how big they are, Alphabet, which is the largest cap uh, company in the United States, uh, uh, Google, uh, in 2016, the exchange rate volatility cost them a billion dollars. They're, they're in group one. And also in group one is Microsoft, and, and uh, in the annual report, they indicate that their losses associated with the exchange rate volatility were 3.3 billion. So we're, we're not talking about chicken feed here. And they're, and they're all hedging, too. <laughs> Both Alphabet and, and, and Microsoft are hedging, and they, and they still lost a billion in terms of a, a Alphabet and 3.3 and billion in terms of Microsoft. In the second group, Procter & Gamble, uh, their losses uh, it, it, due to exchange rate volatility were eight, 880 million, so um, almost a billion dollars. So v very large uh, amounts of money, and, and that is the reason businesses don't like volatility. It, it literally hits the bottom line in, in two ways. One, you, you, you're exposed to losses and you take them with some of these big numbers I've given you, but also you, you've got to buy insurance. Or, or you, almost all of them are, are, are hedging and buying insurance too. Let me just end by my remarks by saying it's time for U.S. monetary policy to be internationalized. Stability might not be everything, but everything is nothing without stability. Thank you very much. Yeah, no. Any, we do want interactivity. Uh, we don't want alternate speeches. Um, but if anybody has questions, shoot. Uh, can I get that microphone? Could you pass that back to your associate? Uh, just tell us who you are and, and your question. Hi, my name is Lewis Woodhill. I'm a software venture capitalist. Um, I just want to understand how the stabilization mechanism would work in a sp specific case. Let's say that. Uh, we have a euro dollar exchange rate of a um, dollar thirty, and um, some big country, <clears throat> India or something, decides to adopt the dollar as its currency, and the the FOMC doesn't react to that demand for dollars, and the exchange rate uh, goes to a, a dollar per euro because the dollar gets more valuable. How does the who does what in your system? Well, in, in that case, the, the, the U.S., and I'm, I'm leaving it vague, I mean, as Mundell said, it would uh, technically be the Treasury, uh, unless they uh, change things. They, they would be buying euro. The euro would be weak, and they'd be buying, buying euros and, and, and uh, selling dollars. So that, that would weaken the dollar. You, you'd come back up from, uh, you know, unit, one unity to, to 120. I mean, they... So, so that's, I'm not getting into the agreement they would need to put in place to formalize this, this is, but that's the, 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 the 
the mechanics of what would go on. Right here. Uh, Michael Lachansky, graduate student at Princeton and uh, probably going to be at Department of Transportation soon. Um, it seems like one alternative that a lot of the companies are pursuing is, uh, you know, hedging. So are there any supply side proposals for increasing the depth and completeness of financial markets as an alternative to uh, exchange rate stabilization policies? Uh, not, not that I know of. Uh, I mean, the, 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 finan the foreign exchange markets are so deep anyway, uh, even, even even minor ones like the South African Rand, I mean, they're trading uh, you know, uh, uh, very large amounts every day. I mean, all, all these markets are very liquid and, and very deep. So, the cost of volatility should be that you're imperfectly hedging, right? So what's the normal econ's perspective on this? And uh, so that's why I was curious. Is it, is it possible that all 100 companies have imperfectly hedged in the, uh, over the last Well, it, it's, it, it's, you know, show, show me somebody who's put a perfect hedge on. I mean, it's, well, <laughs> it's, so it's a, money, yeah, it, 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 you, there, there, there's no one that has a, a perfect insurance policy that, uh, that, that covers absolutely everything, no matter what the cost. So, so these large losses that I indicated at, at Alphabet, uh, Microsoft, and Procter and Gamble, they're, they're all hedging. But they, they, they might decide they don't want to fully hedge. I mean, almost no one hedges 100%. No, number one, it, 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 no one hedges 100% of their hypothetical risk exposure, even because it, it, it's a, it's a cost game, and and it might end up, in their view, and given their expectations, cost them more to to put the the last little bit of hedge on to get perfect, so to speak, uh, than than it's worth. Hi, Francisco Alvarez with the Roosevelt Institute. Uh, I, I think I'm missing some context. Um, I, I, the example of the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy keeps getting cited as um, having stemmed from the, this international volunt uh, volatility. Uh, but I, I, I'm not understanding how that link is being made. I've always understood the bankruptcy being the result of some of their lending investment practices, as well as the way some of their investment vehicles were structured and linked to the housing market. Uh, what, what context am I missing? Oh, the, the, the Lehman, Lehman per se, if the, if the exchange rates would have been stable, the, the, the number one, the, the pressure on Lehman by, by definition wouldn't be a, have been as great. And, and even as Lehman was going, starting to go down, there, there were actually interested foreign buyers that that got cold feet because the dollar was going to the moon almost. So, so Lehman probably never would have gone to the wall with with if we wouldn't have had the exchange rate if the dollar hadn't been soaring. And and even if the dollar if the dollar had, had had stopped soaring at about the time it went down, there were foreign buyers that would, would have bought it. Does that does that answer your question? So, so it was kind of a it was basically a one-two punch. One was the causality of uh, the, all the pressure on Lehman and Lehman's balance sheet as a result uh, of the dollar becoming so strong. And remember, there were other things going on. Look at look at the price of gold. It was it was going down by twenty percent over the period that I had, and, and oil was going down fifty-seven percent. So you had the the most important commodity in the world is oil. <laughs> And, and it dropped by 57 percent in a very short period of time. And this was putting a, a lot of pressure on financial institutions across the board, and including Lehman. So you had that, and, and then you, you had plenty of foreign buyers that, that were very interested in Lehman and, 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 and abandoned ship, basically, because the dollar was getting so strong, and it was becoming more and more expensive. <laughs> Lehman was becoming more and more expensive prospectively for them as the dollar got strong. Uh, Tate Lacey at the Cato Institute. 
Uh, have you guys thought through the ramifications um, by targeting the exchange rate of running into some problems with, say, Goodert's law, or do you feel that um, the, the corridor is broad enough to not to not have some of those complications? And uh, I, I, the, the corridor is fairly broad. It's about 15 percent. And and if you look at the exchange rate volatility, by the way. Um, uh, the the dollar euro rate since 1989 the uh, the, the the range is is uh, if you look at each year and take the high and the low the the, the volatility is about seven and a half percent that's the the lowest number and then it goes up the highest number in the volatility in percentage ter uh, change terms is 22 and a half percent. And, and the average is, is, is about 15%. So the average fluctuation of the dollar euro rate is about 15%. Now, if you're running a business, can you imagine if, you're, if, if, you, if you have a margin that's fluctuating 15% on average? I mean, this is a lot of fluctuation. So, so this has nothing to do, by the way, with running your business. So just think, I'm running a business, and all of a sudden somebody tells me my, my profit margins are going to be fluctuating by 15% a year. I mean, if you, if you look at, uh, at, at any kind of analysis of margins, margins usually don't fluctuate for a business hardly at all. So you're throwing the foreign exchange thing in at the end and, and, and just whipping things around and, and making it very difficult for businesses. Of course, that's why they, they try to hedge to avoid that kind of fluctuation. But still, they, they don't get it all, as you, you can see by looking at the three companies that I mentioned. Uh, Peter Rue, financial advisor from Colorado. Uh, um, was Milton Friedman invited to the 80s uh, conference? Milton wasn't there. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and the source of the problem, ironically, is, is, uh, is, is it, it, at least part of what Milton's message was on floating exchange rates. The other part that, that most people miss, uh, I, I wrote an article in the, in the Cato Journal about this several years ago, is that he was very much for monetary unification in situations where you had very poor performance of central banks and very lousy currencies. He, he was very much for those options that I gave, clone the dollar with a currency board or, or just dollarize your economy like Panama and Ecuador and, and El Salvador. And I guess there we have 33 countries actually use some foreign currency now, not Liechtenstein uses the Swiss franc, so, so there, 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 there's a lot of monetary unification. So, so Friedman, Friedman, you have to read Friedman very carefully, and, and the popular view is that, that he was only for floating exchange rates. No, he, he, he was for monetary unification and currency boards and uh, dollarization, in fact, endorsed a, a, a book that Kurt Schuller and I wrote on Estonia a currency board for Estonia, which they did put in in 1992 when they got rid of the Russian ruble and, and, and put in the kroon. And Friedman endorsed that book, which, uh, of course, with a currency board, <laughs> the kroon was fixed to the, to the Deutschmark and, and backed with 100% Deutschmark reserves. So a, l a, l a little side yeah, remark no, about about Milton, but but, but, the, but it, he 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 and, and George Schultz w was at the conference, and and, and at the time Schultz was, uh, at, we're, we're going at the time of floating. Schultz was uh, one of the, one of the main carriers of the message. Uh, my other question is though: well, Why does Mandel think dollar euro is of crucial importance versus? Uh, um, the yuan dollar or the yen dollar. Um, well, okay, the, the the main thing is what what he said in the clip. It, it, it's such a huge chunk of the international economy. I mean, there there is one international currency, and and that is the dollar. The the world is becoming dollarized as we speak. Uh, if you go to Africa and they, they you know the 
the telephonic banking and so forth that's done, what's the unit of account that's used? It's a dollar. So Africa is dollarizing itself. We, we don't even realize what's going on. Mo most commodities are priced and invoiced in dollars. Even most manufactured goods are, are priced and invoiced in dollars. If you look at trade between England and, and Germany, for example, you, you'd think, well, they're, they're export, they're, it, it must be in euros or sterling. No, uh, about 40% of all the exports from England going to Germany are priced in dollars. So, so we have the, the dollar is a reserve currency, so forth and so on. And, and in terms of just economic size, and I know the way Bob thinks about this, he just looks at the size of the economy and, and that's the, <laughs> the thing that counts. So if you look at the size of the Eurozone and the size of the United States, you've you got, you got a big block there and, and one of them happens to have the international currency in it. The other one has a big regional currency, the Euro. And, and, and Bob's view, as well as mine, I mean, I'm just repeating what <laughs> he taught me, uh, which I believe is that that is the most important price in the world, the dollar euro, and it's just, si it's just the size. Of it. Now, now also, the problem with the yuan, uh, which Song Zhu is gonna be talking about later and give us the in inside scoop on that, uh, the, the problem, it's not convertible. So, so in, in fact, it's kind of in the, in the it, it will become, I think, important. I think Mundell, more important. I think Mundell also has the same view. He spent a lot of time in China and working on the, on the yuan and convertibility of the yuan. The key is to get the yuan convertible. And then, then it will be part, there'll be the big three. The, the yen is, is just an important, hardly regional currency. I mean, it's, it's really a domestic currency. Thank you. Uh, I'm Rob Scott with the Economic Policy Institute, so I'm interested in the demand side. And uh, as a lead up to the Plaza Accord, as you know, there was a there were growing uh, uh, real side uh, trade imbalances, which were addressed, as, uh, I think, in part as a result of the currency realignment that occurred uh, as an outgrowth of the Plaza Accord. We have real trade imbalances that are, that are growing uh, today. Uh, we have a, uh, a huge uh, a growing uh, a trade surplus in Asia and also in Europe, much of it centered in Germany. And so how is that going to be addressed with some of the proposals that you're, uh, you've developed? Oh, the, 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 it isn't going to be addressed because the, the, the trade imbalances are, are a function of, of the relationship between savings and investment, and the, the U.S. has had a trade deficit every year since 1975, and, and it's because we have a savings deficiency in the United States. It, 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 the, the only, so, so in, in the current context of things, getting, let's get to the real world here, we, we, have, a, we have a Trump administration that's, that's very agitated about the trade deficit, and, they're, that's an objective. They want to shrink that and, and so forth, which if, if that's true, uh, you don't do it by uh, uh, bashing the, the Chinese or who, whoever is the, the big, the Chinese are obviously the biggest contributor to the, the uh, filling that um, trade deficit uh, be, because you, you have to look at, it's all, the trade deficit's homegrown, so you, you would have to eliminate the fiscal deficit in the United States. Why, why do we dis, one big chunk of dis savings is we're running a, a government deficit. <laughs> so if I wanted to shrink the, the trade deficit, if I thought that was important, which I, which I don't think it's important my, myself, but if I, if I thought it was important, I wanted to shrink it, the, the way to do that would be to change from a fiscal deficit to a fiscal surplus in, in the United States and the savings deficiency would shrink dramatically and the, the trade deficit would, would, would wither quite a bit. Maybe it wouldn't go away. So how do exchange rates fit into the picture? The exchange rates do fit into the picture because they, they do have some influence over who is filling the deficit. 
The deficit is defined by the United States in the relationship between savings and investment in the United States. So, so we know how big it's going to be. The question is, well, who, who's going to be filling it? And there, it depends on how competitive people are. And to some extent, exchange rates will affect how uh, different countries' competitiveness ranks and, and, and how uh, competitive they are in, in filling that deficit. So, so it's kind of allocating who's going to be filling the deficit but having n virtually no effect on the deficit size itself. That, that's us that determines that. But it did shrink in, in 1985 to, uh, to 1990. Who canceled the deficit? In, following in, the Plaza Accord. Yeah, following the Plaza Accord. But, but it, that, that's, that's because the... the, the the, the savings deficiency in the United States shrunk. The, the trade deficit is just, by definition, it's an accounting identity, and, and it, it, it is a function of the savings deficiency in the United States. And everyone talking about trade and the trade deficit get all worked up about exchange rates and, 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 and non-tariff barriers and you, you, you name it, everything under the sun, and, and it's all just irrelevant. It's, it's our savings deficiency. That, that's what drives the and, and determines the size of the uh, trade deficit that we're facing. So I, my, my, my view, let, let's finish with the Trump thing a, a little bit. So what, what's my uh, likely scenario? Let, let us say that everything tr the Trump administration said they wanted to do, they, they actually can do. That, that implies, most analysts think, that the fiscal deficit would, would increase in the United States. So the so savings deficiency is going to get bigger, the trade deficit will get bigger. And, 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 and the Trump administration will become, in their, in, in their stupidity and frustration, even more angry and agitated about trade and, and, uh, and, and things. The next uh, uh, meeting done in Palm Beach with uh, the leaders from China maybe won't be quite so smooth. You'll be going back to really Japan, 1980s. I mean, that's that's the problem we had in the Reagan years. I mean, Reagan was supposedly a big free trader, and he he was rhetorically. There was no question about that. But you had all of these Trumpite kind of people around the administration, who who were very agitated about what. The Japanese, the Japanese were accounting for up to 60% of the trade deficit <laughs> at, at their peak. And so then it, then, then it, was, it was the Jap bashing thing. And, and, the, and, and, the, and the Japanese accommodated a lot of that with an ever appreciating yen. Re remember the yen <laughs> in, in 1971, I think was, was fixed at still at 360. And, and by what, it went, it went down to 80. I mean, it, it, was, it was ever appreciating because un, unlike the Chinese, the Japanese were letting their arm be bent and, and twisted as much as possible, even to the extent where you had voluntary restraints by the Japanese put on themselves uh, to, to stop exporting cars to the United States in the 1980s. So that, that's how bad it got. But, the, but, but what was the problem then? <laughs> the, the problem was the savings deficiency in the United States. That, that was the engine driving the trade deficit. So we have time right now for, for one more. Yes, uh, Song Zhuxian from uh, Renmin University of China. Steve, you proposed to stabilize dollar euro exchange rate between 1.2 to 1.4. I remember at least seven years ago, Bob Mondale proposed the exact same idea. Where, Very short where, question. Where do you how think high? I got the idea, yeah. Sanju? Yeah. <laughs> how high probability to realize the mechanism? I don't think it's possible oh, I, for I, I the U.S. I, and the I, I, Euro I, to sign agreements to I, do that. I, I think the probability is uh, close to zero. <laughs> it, it, it's too bad. I, 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 <laughs> so Steve, that's that we, not, that's uh, not <laughs> no, 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 Jimmy. Th this is a very Kempian thing because because your father 
would, would, was, would, would swim uh, upstream uh, against the flow. And, and he would do that, as you indicated. He, he could articulate and explain to people what, why he wanted the, the Kemp Roth tax cut, for example. And, and, and public opinion drives politicians. That is the only thing they live by, believe it or not. And, and the only thing that they uh, can live by. So it, it's explaining to people in forums like this why volatility is bad. We, we, we don't really have to explain that to them. They already know it's bad. They don't like it. But we have to explain the source of the volatility being primarily this dollar-euro exchange rate right now. If you, if you settle that down, uh, and, and this is very much the, the reason that, that Bob, 120 and 140, you asked, well, why did Bob come up with the number? He told me once, he says, oh, it's, it, they're good even numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're not talking about heavy science here. It's just, and, and it, it, it's true. I mean, I, I remember some of these currency boards, Schuler and I have had a hand in, in putting in, and, and <laughs> Warren Coates also in, in Bosnia. Uh, you, it's it's good to pick an even number for an exchange rate. Odd, odd numbers get kind of messy, and and people don't like that. And and then and then pretty soon they they don't like the whole system, simply because it's hard to divide. And <laughs> so Steve, thank you. Let's give Steve a round of applause. Thank you for.